How's everyone doing? My name is Yupari and I'd like to welcome you to this week's portrait painting demonstration. And in this week's video, we're going to be using a different setup. I have a uh, what you would call a parallel palette uh, toned with a uh, neutral gray over some glass so you could see all of my mixtures. For my brushes today, I'll be starting off with uh, regular bristle brushes and then work my way to a synthetic bristle mix. And then uh, as I progress, I'll be using more and more synthetic brushes as I go. For the majority of this video, my brushes will be typically size 4 filberts. To the left of my cup here, I have a regular odorless paint thinner, and to the right, I have a 1 fifth stand oil to 4 fifths paint thinner mixture, and I will use that as my medium. But you won't actually see uh, this cup for the rest of the video, so just know that I'll be using it to clean my brushes now and then and um, dipping into my medium. Now remember, stand oil is a slow dryer, that's why I use it. As I get started here, I'm going to let the colors that I'll be using run across the bottom right corner of my screen so you can read exactly what colors that I'll be using. As I get started, I should also note that uh, this video in particular, uh, you're going to see every single brush stroke and every single mixture. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but this painting I was able to create in under an hour and 30 minutes uh, so I'm able to uh, maintain all of that footage and still uh, explain to you the uh, critical information in terms of making this painting but it was painted in a very uh, expressionistic way this painting is definitely one where I loosened up a little bit and felt my way around the canvas a little more than my usual ones and I'm trying out this parallel palette, this glass palette to the left of my canvas uh, so that you can see more clearly what colors I'm mixing uh, with that uh, neutral gray color and so that it's readily available to you so you don't, I don't have to keep switching back and forth between camera angles. Uh, now I do like using my other palette uh, a little bit more, uh, mainly because I'm used to it. Um, but I just wanted to try this uh, palette setup for you all um, so you can see more and more of my actual mixing process as I go. So let's get to it. What am I doing? I'm using my size 4 Filbert bristle brush. Uh, as a drawing brush and I'm using just my raw umber color uh, and if you're still a little confused about my palette setup as I uh, do this block in I'll explain what they are in addition to me actually listing them out so the whites I have two two dots of titanium white one dot of my zinc white my lead white and then I'll read it from left to right so I have raw umber burnt umber alizarin crimson cadmium red light Cadmium orange, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, sap green, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. Uh, so I read it from left to right. Uh, just in case there's any confusion to uh, me listing the colors out earlier on. Uh, but so what am I doing now? I'm using my drawing brush dipped with a little bit of my paint thinner, but not very much. I'd say about maybe, and maybe 5% paint thinner to 95%. So 5% paint thinner to about maybe 95% paint, not a lot of paint thinner, um, and I'm using it as my drawing brush. I'm quickly blocking in uh, the outside shape of the head. Um, remember in the beginning I made indications for my top and my bottom, uh, most dimensions of the portrait just to place the head in space. And then I loosely uh, blocked in the outside shape. I usually start off kind of that way with the outside shape. And then I created the axis, uh, if you will, of you can look at that cross looking thing in the center of the face. The line, the vertical line is the vertical area of that cross looking thing in the middle of the face. That's my center line. So that's giving me the overall tilt of the head, it's tilted a little bit to the left of the canvas. And I also have a uh, cross, or the shorter area of the cross, which is the axis of the eyes. Um, but now I tend to uh, unify an, a single large line encompassing the axis of the eyes as well as the brow ridge, the area, 
the area containing uh, the eyebrows. And in this case, I'm going to be making some uh, loose marks for where I think the placement of the eye is going to go uh, within that line, that axis line for the eyes. I also have a place marker for where the nose is going to go and a place marker for the mouth. And so I'm kind of using my eye with this now. I'm not really trying to measure too uh, too much. I want to keep this painting very uh, expressionistic. I want to be loose. I want to be free. And I want to be expressionistic with this painting. And I want to carry on that mentality in my head that I'm creating a painting and not a photograph. So I'm working in such a way that I'm not uh, too timid in the beginning and I'm going to try to not be too timid across the uh, middle stages and even into the uh, final stages of this painting. And you'll see that I'm making large gestural marks, gestural meaning I'm moving very freely around the canvas. I've uh, blocked in uh, a loose, a thin hatch mark for the, the shadow or if you will a light wash still with my drawing color just applying a little less pressure to the brush uh, made the shadow of the face a little bit lighter and applying more pressure and a little bit more paint uh, to the hair mass the dark of the hair mass also will create a darker mark for the hair um, so in any case I'm trying to be uh, very loose and free and gestural with the start and throughout this whole painting but still maintain uh, respect to the accuracy of the drawing. Uh, now I'm not measuring too much, I'm just uh, standing pretty far back uh, from my canvas. I'm pretty much at an arm's length from my canvas and I do that so that I can get uh, more of a, a viewer's perspective of the painting as opposed to being too close up and too hung up on uh, any kind of minutia or any kind of tiny details. So I'm keeping myself at arm's length from the painting and I'm holding the brush from uh, the rear of the brush. I'm holding the brush from the back of the brush as you notice uh, my hand on the brush. And this is also so that I can work through my arm uh, instead of using my fingers and my wrist too much in the beginning. Um, kind of like uh, in school taking an essay or something like that. You're going to be holding your uh, pencil really tightly and using your wrist and your fingers uh, to write as neatly as possible. I'm doing the opposite of that. Though I'm not trying to be too sloppy, I'm trying to be in a nice uh, middle ground between expressive and dynamic and still uh, concrete and understanding. So holding the brush from the back, uh, the back end of the brush, helps me keep my arm straight I'm working throughout my arm and I'm still able to make uh, these decisive marks using straight lines and angles. Also as a testament to the fact that I'm not using too much of my thinner on the actual paint you'll notice that the paint won't be dripping off the side of my palette too much. Uh, now remember this is a parallel palette setup meaning that the palette is directly parallel to my canvas. And so I was actually kind of worried that it would be dripping off, but it actually wasn't dripping off all that much. Uh, so let that also be a testament to the fact that I'm not using too much uh, thinner. And another thing that may happen, and this happens to me all the time, is if I use too much of my thinner, too much of my medium, in my throughout my painting especially if my painting is rather dark like a dark background dark middle tones and dark foreground and all that um, it tends to uh, dry kind of um, I'd say I don't want to say chalky but dries kind of in a way that you lose um, your values and actually that can be kind of a, a hindrance if you're working on several layers of the painting but um, if you use a little less of the uh, thinner, a little less of the the medium throughout the beginning of the painting, that usually um, will cut back on that. Now, when oil paintings dry, they do lose uh, the depth of the darkness and the middle tones, and that's why we varnish them, and that's why we uh, 
if you've seen any of my other uh, videos like the uh, the realist portrait painting series that I had I oiled out each layer meaning I applied uh, a thin wash of medium uh, just to bring back those values but remember that's only temporary um, so when a painting is complete and it you let it dry for a little while uh, you get those values back only once you start only once you varnish it so that's the little materials thing all right, so as far as the painting is concerned, I uh, loosely blocked in uh, the portrait, loosely uh, meaning that I was uh, moving my arm free freely around uh, the surface, making large, simple uh, simplifications. And now I'm starting to put in uh, my values. And I, I like to work from my darkest value up, even whether I'm working on a a toned ground or a uh, just a white canvas like I'm working on uh, this week I I'm using a mixture of my burnt umber and my ultramarine blue and I didn't want it to be too dark so I dipped a little bit into my yellow ochre as you saw me uh, mixing before and um, this painting is going to be uh, completed in one sitting remember I said I painted it in under an hour and 30 minutes so it's very much in the uh, alla prima realm of painting. Uh, alla prima meaning done in one sitting or in one day. So I'm going to try to optimize as much as I can here. So I left a little bit of the raw umber sketch that I had in the hair. Remember I applied that raw umber to the hair. And then as I put in the darker mass for the hair, I left some of those patches of the raw umber to show, uh, to uh, basically indicate the uh, highlight regions of the hair. And some of the darker masses are actually darker in the hair because they're turning away from the light. So I'm separating the light and the dark with the hair mass as well. Now I'm going to start filling in a value for the uh, shadow plane of the face. Uh, remember, a plane is just a, a uh, three-dimensional idea of a flat surface in space. So think of a plane as pretty much holding up a flat sheet of paper in space. That's a plane. Um, so in any case, the plane, uh, the shadow plane of the side of the face, I'm um, going to be... Um, filling it in with a value that's pretty dark, pretty close to the hair. Uh, the light that I used, um, uh, the light that we used for this uh, photo reference was a really wonderful and um, strong light. Uh, my, my friends actually were so nice to me, they helped me uh, set up this light with just a regular uh, lamp and like an engineer tipped over the, the lamp and uh, wrapped it in foil to, to create a clamp light kind of thing and then used some paper towel as a diffuser uh, so really awesome setup uh, that my friends created for me um, but in any case the light is pretty strong and created some very nice and crisp light and shadow delineation so that's why I went uh, fairly dark pretty quickly uh, with the shadow plane of the face uh, but if you noticed in the mixing, I used a little bit more of my uh, yellow ochre uh, to lighten it up and warm it up just a little bit. And right now, what I'm doing actually is with a clean bristle brush and a little bit more of my paint thinner, a little bit, I'm carving away now um, at the shadow plane, trying to carve it out more. So I typically call this my eraser brush, though I'm not erasing too much uh, with this one and then racer brush is pretty much just a separate bristle brush with a little more paint thinner and that can be used to push around the paint just as an eraser would um, and kneaded eraser if you're familiar with that uh, an eraser brush is pretty much like a kneaded eraser uh, to a uh, piece of charcoal that you would have been using to create the block in now remember with this video in particular, not a single brush stroke is omitted from the footage. So every clip that you see, every brush stroke that you see will be the 
actual brush strokes the entire all of the painting is in this video um, but I will say that the temperature of my light source in my studio uh, kind of changes a little bit so that's kind of a uh, a little bit of a disclaimer I don't know what happened I think one of my light bulbs is actually dying uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and replace those uh, those bulbs uh, for next week's video but in any case now I'm starting to mix the uh, dark lights. Remember, uh, I like to work my way from the uh, darker values up to the lighter values, and this is especially the case if I'm working on a white surface, so an untoned gessoed canvas like this one. I like to work my way from the shadow to the dark lights to the half tones and then up to the light lights. And another nice thing about this um, palette setup is that if you're unsure of any of the paint mixtures that I created, um, please feel free to slow down the video, pause it, or scroll around as I mix the paint on the palette, and you'll be able to see more clearly and more with more uh, definition, uh, with more clarity, you'll be able to see with more clarity exactly what mixtures I used to create uh, what kind of uh, flesh tone or what kind of value on the surface of this canvas. And um, also please let me know uh, how you feel about this parallel palette setup. I really do miss my wooden palette, but I, I wanted to do this for you all so you can see absolutely all of the mixtures. Uh, involved in the painting. So yeah, let me know what you think about this palette setup, whether I should uh, keep it or not um, in the comment section or uh, send me an email through my website. In the description uh, there will be a link to my website and I'm usually much easier to reach that way. Um, but in any case, yeah, please let me know what you think about this new palette setup. I actually uh, really liked it for the uh, purpose of mixing the colors right next to the surface because the palette is under the same light as the painting. So I can really see exactly what uh, flesh tones and what values that I was creating uh, at that moment in time. So with this dark light value that I'm um, creating on the surface of the um, the face, I'm pretty much trying to indicate the most emphatic dark lights, uh, meaning the most, uh, the deepest dark lights. Now a dark light is pretty much just a, what, is, what it sounds like, a dark light. It's um, usually the light that is pretty much nearest to the shadow, um, but I should also n note that I would, I do not want any of the values on the light plane of the face, the light area of the face to ever be in confusion uh, with any of the values in the shadow plane of the face. Um, and for photographers they tend to use uh, double light sources and photography uh, well I, I will be speaking from what I have been told. I do not know exactly the accuracy of what I'm going to say, but uh, photographers uh, tend to want to eliminate shadows, whereas painters want to uh, create shadows. Now, this is coming from uh, my teachers in the past. Uh, I do not know the clarity of that statement, um, but in any case, Maintaining the light and the shadow separate is a hugely important factor into the development of a realist portrait painting. If, if anything, spend all of your time figuring out your light and shadow shapes and maintain all of the values that you place in the light in the light. Meaning, don't ever confuse them with any of the values in the shadow. Now of course as I mentioned before uh, that may be different for photography 
but I don't know. That is what I was told before, so I thought I would mention that um, in this clip. But in any case, maintaining the light and shadow separate is the most uh, critical element to the development of the uh, realist portrait painting, or any kind of realist painting uh, in general. And so what I'm doing now is pretty much building up now from my dark lights um, into more of my middle lights. But at the same time, I'm going to be uh, further refining uh, things like right now the placement of the eye. Uh, so I pretty much like to switch back and forth around the surface of the painting. And I actually keep, uh, although you can't see it, I actually keep separate brushes uh, for different regions and different tasks on the painting. Now this might sound like a lot of work to do, um, but I actually do it so that I can minimize the amount of work that I have to do. Um, so I separate a brush for the light and the shadow, uh, most importantly, but I subdivide it even further than that. I have a dark, dark brush, so that would have been the one used for the hair. I have a brush a little bit lighter than that so for the uh, form shadow of the face so that's two brushes right there and then I have a brush for the dark lights or the half tones and that's going to be a third brush and then I have another brush for the uh, light light regions of the face so that's going to be a fourth brush and then I'm going to have smaller brushes uh, I'm going to be using two size zero rounds, two small synthetic size zero rounds, but I'll get into that in further clips when I actually start to use them. Um, but separating uh, these brushes and ordering them for these specific tasks are uh, actually cuts down on a lot of time. It really has helped me uh, work a lot faster, but um, I don't mean faster in the sense of trying to create a painting fast. I mean, what I mean by faster is it just it helps me to cut back on the amount of uh, cleaning that I have to do on each brush, and it helps me keep the actual mixtures a little bit uh, cleaner. And um, notice also that the the values are on my palette moving from dark up to light and notice the same thing is happening on the painting the values are now moving from dark to light now areas on the face such as this brush stroke right now are going to be a little bit darker than their surrounding areas uh, because that plane remember the plane is just a flat surface in space is angled a little bit further away from the light. So the value on the form is a spatial relationship. A spatial relationship meaning picture a light beam flashed on a closed door. That door is receiving all the light. And then as you start to open that door, that door starts to receive less and less light until it's parallel to the light beam and then is completely in shadow. And so that's why I vary uh, my values and that's how I approach form on the painting is by thinking about the angle between those planes in space in relation to uh, the light source. In this case I was very fortunate to have a clean and crisp light source uh, such that my values are much easier for me to uh, identify and to render. So keeping that organization on the palette as you see me uh, using my brushes, uh, switching between my brushes to move from my darker regions to my lighter regions, uh, maintaining that organization on the palette uh, in theory should uh, make a more well understood and more organized image on the canvas. So in theory the organization on the palette should show up on the painting. Now that is only in theory. I oftentimes screw things up 
a lot. I oftentimes make a lot of mistakes. We're all human. Think about your mistakes as just a stepping stone to success, as I've mentioned in other videos. You gotta make mistakes to learn things sometimes. And being able to work in such a freeing way. Now notice how many values I'm putting on to the surface in a relatively short amount of time. Being able to work in that kind of uh, free and liberating way is a lot of fun for me and is something that I also need to work on. I've been told that I really need to work on loosening up a little bit sometimes, not being so systematic and applying each and every brush stroke um, with a lot of freedom and sometimes I'm not even thinking too much about what I explained to you about the planes and I'm kind of feeling my way around the surface of the structure uh, little by little but in any case in terms of the educational uh, bits of advice that I'm trying to give to you organizing the palette keeping yourself uh, structured is very useful in terms of your technique but also having that freedom uh, to move around the surface of the painting rather freely. It's kind of a duality between the mind and the heart. Uh, the mind is gauging what is ne what needs to be placed on the surface. So I first observed with my eyes uh, what's in front of me. Then I use my mind to figure out that spatial relationship and then I try to work through my heart in such a way that I feel out exactly what brush strokes that I'm going to be placing. So I work from my eyes observe, my mind makes these decisions, and my heart guides my brush. Not trying to sound too cheesy, but that's pretty much how I feel whenever I'm trying to make a realist painting. I also try to introduce a lot of variety into my technique and my approach to painting. Um, I've started out paintings in uh, raw umber um, and worked over it uh, after it dried with uh, more flesh tones. I've started out with my eraser brush and my drawing brush and uh, more aggressive, uh, more abstract starts. I started out, uh, I did one where I started it out with the charcoal sketch and then worked with large simplified masses. So the approach that I'm using on this one is I'm working on a white surface and I used my drawing brush and pretty much worked in a very loose and expressionistic way. Um, when I say that, I mean that I worked in a way that was uh, free. I was freely moving the brush around the surface to draw the block in and then I started to build up from uh, the darks and using the white surface actually helps me see my darks uh, very very clearly. Now that can also be a, kind of a challenge. A lot of people don't like to work on white uh, but hey I like to change things around once in a while and I feel like that helps me personally in my development as a uh, painter to work on different tones, to start paintings in different uh, different ways, and to not always do everything the same. Uh, notice how many values I'm putting onto the surface of the face with this one. If you've seen my other paintings, you would have known. Uh, you would know that I usually cover the surface quite rapidly um, but in this one I'm kind of uh, chilling out a little bit and adding more and more of these uh, value differentiations much earlier on uh, than, uh, than usual almost kind of trying to obtain that final pass with the first brush stroke but um, saying that would also be kind of uh, misleading because I am thinking about starting, uh, I am applying these values a little bit warmer and a little bit darker uh, than the final result. Uh, now you may have heard me say that a million times, but 
I'm applying these values a little bit warmer and a little bit darker so that I can build up lighter values as I go because I will be using more and more of the white in my mixtures as I build up the values and remember white itself is a coolant uh, but in any case that technique that I just explained to you I'm not relying on it too much with this one uh, here we are about uh, nearly 31 minutes into the painting and I still haven't completely covered the entire surface of the face which is something I've never done before I don't think on my YouTube channel or any of my demonstration paintings and I'm pretty much taking my time uh, with my brushes trying to sculpt out these values quite rapidly as I move around the face completely different to how I usually work yet still trying to keep the the initial color pass a little bit lighter and a little bit warmer um, so not to confuse you I am making my values a little bit lighter and a little bit warmer but not too much um, if you've seen some of my other starts I made the initial pass much warmer much darker than this um, but this one I'm going for more specificity much faster uh, than my other paintings and that could be the reason why this painting was developed in under an hour and 30 minutes and it and it's pretty much that's likely the reason uh, why I'm able to show you each and every brush stroke involved in the development of this painting let it be known that portrait painting is like any kind of discipline where there are many different routes to obtain the same kind of result that you're after and uh, with saying that with that in mind also know that the more variety that you introduce into the way that you work um, the more likely you are going to find a way that works for you and I'm trying to do that for myself but at the same time I'm trying to introduce more and more approaches to portrait painting for you so that maybe one of these videos is the way that you should or the way that is easier for you to work and easier for you to understand now that's what I'm trying to do by introducing uh, many different ways to start a painting or to develop a painting uh, hoping that one of these techniques will be the one for you the one to help you develop in advance in your own painting style and painting technique um, but with all of these different approaches they all will tend to intersect at the end um, and the reason that all of these approaches intersect at the end meaning and if your end result is a if you want your end result to be a more finished and uh, naturalistic looking painting the reason that all of those methods intersect is because they follow the same principles uh, principle being the most essential elements to realism which is like I mentioned before, keeping everything in the light, in the light, everything in the shadow, in the shadow, and applying different value transitions based on spatial relationships. Now those are essential elements to a realist painting. But the order at which you obtain and the order at which you utilize each of the uh, fundamentals is up to you. You can start out with a more uh, flat, organized, a simplified mass like I have done with many of my videos or you can start off with a more loose and gestural yet well um, placed block in in the beginning like I did with this one and then attack the surface of the painting if you will uh, with your value transitions in a very fast way. 
um, that's another way to do it. So that's why, uh, that's how these uh, techniques, these approaches all tend to intersect um, towards the final result, which is a, a realist portrait painting or a realist painting. And hey, if you don't want to make a realist painting, you don't have to. You can use these techniques, you can use these fundamentals to create any kind of image that you want. In the two-dimensional realm of painting, there are many, many ways you can go. You can create an abstract painting that still has an understanding of these fundamentals. You can create a hyper-realist painting and it still wouldn't follow these fundamentals uh, in terms of shape, value, color, light, shadow, and form. Uh, or a surrealistic image if you want to exaggerate your drawing. That's completely up to you, but I'm trying to give you these uh, these fundamentals and I'm trying to introduce uh, different approaches to creating a painting so that you may find one that you will be able to uh, further develop and further enjoy on your own. And as I start to uh, introduce more values onto the the lip, I'm going to be uh, or the lips, I'm going to be uh, placing a dark value, the dark accent uh, where the two lips meet each other. So remember, your dark accents are where two forms uh, intersect or touch, uh, therefore receiving a little less light. And I'm going to place the uh, dark accent in between where the two lips meet, uh, overdoing it a little bit uh, so that I can come back into it with a uh, separate brush. And I'm going to put another dark uh, mass underneath of the bottom lip. Of course, I'm going to be overdoing it just a tad bit so that I can uh, come back into it with a different brush. And I like to work in this way where I sometimes I overdo a value or overdo a shape uh, with the idea of coming back into it with a, another brush and carving out a more specific shape. Now I'm going to be coming back into it with a, uh, a darker value. <clears throat> Notice I'm on the darker region of my value scale, um, but I'm working with a uh, more of an alizarin crimson mixture. I believe uh, with lips I tend to use a little bit more alizarin crimson for my uh, warm colors as opposed to my cadmium red light. Alizarin crimson or alizarin permanent um, is a, a nice dark transparent red. It mixes uh, very well uh, with other colors without over saturating uh, the color and, st and it still creates a nice uh, deep rich red. Uh, that's a little bit more believable for the darker regions of the lip. But as I move up across the lip, I do introduce more of my uh, saturated, more saturated pinks. And so with the pinks, I typically use a little more of my uh, cadmium red, actually, uh, with a little of my uh, lead white. Um, the lead white, the, the reason I use lead white is because it's a uh, transparent white. Uh, so it allows me to raise up a value a little bit more and maintain uh, the depth of that color. Now I don't always want that. Uh, sometimes I want to raise up a value much more and still maintain a little bit of that color and that's what I use titanium white for and that titanium white I actually use uh, more in the start and more uh, in general on the painting so I use more titanium white than the lead white uh, because uh, the reason is that I have to cover more of the surface and uh, adjust all of these values on a much uh, more dynamic value range um, but it's only when I come into these uh, minor adjustments, like a, the lighter region above the lip, where I uh, use my lead white. And even in the rendering, uh, when I get into more uh, minute value changes, then I use 
uh, more of the lead white in that case. As I start to fill in some of these uh, masses now uh, for the, the shadow and for the values on the shirt, uh, remember a mass just means a large region of uh, color and value, uh, but in any case, as I fill in these regions of paint, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the paint palette, actually. There's something I don't usually talk about, um, but it's just my belief that I think I suppose, really, that working your way up from a more limited palette is uh, actually the way to go if you want to learn how to really uh, optimize your color mixtures. Now, I'm not trying to play down uh, an extended palette by any means. I mean, I started out with a fairly extended palette myself um, at Studio in Kaminati, uh, the school that I went to for a little while, um, just two semesters, um, in Philadelphia. Now they start out with a broad, prismatic color, um, a color palette, and that's great. I mean, that's that helped me quite a ton in terms of my color perception because I was able to play around with colors a lot. But in my opinion, now this is only my opinion, this is not meant to upset anyone, but I believe that starting out with a more limited palette, like say the Zorn palette, uh, using just four colors, black, white, cadmium, red, and yellow ochre, can help you appreciate what large spectrum of colors you can create with such a limited, uh, such a small palette. And then, after you really know how to create that large spectrum of colors from that limited palette, like the Zorn palette that I mentioned, black, white, yellow ochre, cadmium red, once you learn how to create those mixtures, then you're like, huh, I think I need a little bit more of a opaque green that I can't get from my black and my white and my yellow ochre. Now black, white, and yellow ochre create a nice green, but if you want a little bit more depth in your green, that's where the sap green comes in. Then you're like, oh, okay, let's now add the sap green. So now you're extending your palette based on that necessity, um, based on that understanding of why you need that color. What specific tasks does that sap green do? Now sap green uh, and cadmium red light create a very uh, beautiful flesh tone, believe it or not, even though that they're, even though red and green are complementary colors, it creates a wonderful flesh tone. I didn't know that when I was working with the, the 22 colors on my palette. I was more feeling out the uh, the colors. I'm sorry for the temperature change in the lighting. Uh, it changed a little bit warmer. I think, as I mentioned before, my bulb was dying. Uh, but in any case, so then I understood how, okay, I can see what the sap green can do. And then I'm like, hmm, I want a deeper, richer yellow that's not so chromatic. Huh. Maybe I can go with my cadmium yellow mixed with my burnt umber. Okay, now I see the reason that I would want those two colors together. Cadmium yellow and burnt umber also produce nice and subtle flesh tones. And so, and of course, burnt umber is a wonderful drawing color because it doesn't, if you don't use too much of it, it doesn't affect the surrounding colors that much. It's a very nice and weak color. So as we're moving our way up from that limited four color palette, now you start to see why I believe that building your way up from a smaller palette actually helps you appreciate the broad spectrum that is obtainable with each and every color added onto your palette. That is only my opinion. 
and it's something that I don't normally talk about uh, in my videos. So I thought, hey, I should probably mention that uh, because I never talked about it before, and I'm only just learning about it now, uh, that it really does help, in my opinion, to build your way up. And um, not to confuse you too much uh, with the video, all I did was create a light and a dark mass uh, for the shirt. I added a little bit more of a uh, shape and refinement to the outside shape of the hair mass and a little bit more of the darker values uh, on the neck um, pretty much completing the outside shape of the the face the outside shape of the shoulders and the neck and now I'm gonna go in with a uh, middle green uh, but kind of hazed out a little gray uh, so I added in a little bit of the um, burnt umber and to warm it up uh, so the burnt umber warmed up the uh, the middle green and then neutralized it a little bit with the raw umber and then cooled it down ever so slightly with the lead white and that lead white helped me to raise the value up just a tad bit I want the background to be just a little bit lighter than the hair but I want it to be dark and neutral and uh, so that's why I used those mixtures to uh, to create a type of effect for the background uh, now let's talk a little bit about edges as well notice I'm creating a very nice uh, crisp edge across the side of the shirt uh, with this brush uh, some edges I want to be very sharp and others I want to be more on the softer side. Uh, so let's think about edge quality uh, ranging from super soft to completely razor sharp. Now uh, think of some uh, think of an edge that is super soft as uh, maybe the lighter region of your value scale. Now um, this is only an analogy. So think of the area, okay, so the lightest area on the value scale is analogous to the softest edge on uh, the painting, and the darkest edge is of course analogous, or sorry, the sharpest edge is actually analogous to uh, the darkest value on the value scale. And I'm making this analogy because we want a nice spectrum uh, of edge quality to work with. And now I've been criticized before for making my edges too sharp uh, in many regions, so I've been kind of trying to work on that. Um, but in any case, the sharpness of an edge uh, can be created with two factors. The physical um, the physical boundary between two areas of paint where they meet, uh, like the shirt that I was talking about, that corner of the shirt, um, that physical boundary, if you create a sharp edge that way by placing a very crisp brush stroke across another uh, region of paint creating that sharp edge, or you can also vary the edge um, based on something that's purely optical. So putting a white against a black, kind of like the yin and yang picture, uh, on its own creates a very uh, definitive edge. And of course, sharpening an edge um, based on the application of paint also plays a role in that. So those two factors also create um, focal points. Now, a focal point is a region on uh, the painting or the picture at which you want the viewer's eye to reach first. Um, so now, if the focal point in this painting is likely going to be the eyes, uh, so the notice the dark, um, the values near the eyes are contrasting pretty, pretty highly with the uh, values around it. Um, and so that's kind of the focal point that I want with pretty much all my portraits. 
Um, I want that focal point to be the eyes or in the center of the eyes. Uh, kind of like when you're in conversation with somebody, you want to be uh, directed towards their eyes or somewhere in between their eyes. Uh, so I kind of sharpen the edges a little bit uh, when you approach the eyes. When I approach the eyes, I tend to sharpen the edges just a little bit on the form. And I also sharpen the edges on the outside of the face. Uh, so uh, the edges across the uh, side of the face, closer to the actual eyes, uh, like the, uh, the edges between the, the background and the dark of the hair. Now I will sharpen that edge and soften this one that I'm applying right now. So I'll soften this edge further away uh, from the eyes just a little bit okay so now edges also play a role in uh, the way you develop form uh, now this isn't uh, going to be the only thing that creates a, uh, a form of course form is solely dependent on uh, your values your understanding of your applications of tones of paint but uh, some areas will have a much uh, softer edge, like the areas around the zygomatic bone, the cheekbone, uh, will be a little bit softer. And then areas such as uh, the separation from the top of the lip uh, to the philtrum, the philtrum being the area between the nose and the top of the lip, will have a little bit more of a sharper edge quality. And um, on an optical uh, on an optical note, areas of high contrast in terms of values, such as uh, the region, uh, say the high lit region uh, by the the top of the nose that you saw me place earlier, across the dark light around the side of the eye, will also be a much uh, more defined edge, a sharper edge, and the edge quality will get softer around the side of the face uh, because it's a much more uh, gentle form uh, wrapping around the side of the face and then a little bit harder up closer to the brow ridge as I just painted just now. Uh, a lighter value uh, with my smaller brushes, uh, my smaller size zero round brushes. Uh, so that's uh, how I perceive edge quality. Now it's something that I certainly need to improve upon and uh, painters far better than me have told me um, this information that I'm giving you now that uh, to vary the edge quality and think of the variety in edge somewhat analogous to your variety uh, in value. A great deal of uh, work can be done with the edges but now I don't really think about the edges too much because I'm always so caught up on the shape the value and the form uh, but edge quality does play an important role in uh, the development of the painting uh, now notice even with my smaller size zero round brushes I uh, notice this one has a little bit of tape on it I actually differentiate um, my dark brush and my light brush even with my uh, small size zero round brushes. So what I did was uh, with a little bit of the um, the white I dipped into the mixture that I had for the background uh, the uh, and a little bit of the uh, flesh colors and I'm going to be using this mixture uh, for the the white of the eye uh, known as the sclera. Now the sclera um, is a very uh, very particular color and it almost uh, I haven't really seen it vary too much uh, from model to model um, but that does depend on uh, the lighting but in any case uh, I typically use a combination of raw umber and a tad bit of my uh, uh, lead white to create a gray and then I introduce a tad bit of the flesh tone not too much into that mixture. Uh, so the, the white of the eye, the sclera, is um, in general a, a local color that's a little bit cooler 
um, than the flesh tones, but there is a little bit of a uh, of that flex that flesh tone mixture involved in the uh, the sclero, just a little bit, and um, the value of course depends on the lighting situation, uh, but in this painting the sclera is just a little bit lighter uh, than the pupil. Uh, being the dark of the eye, just a little bit lighter than the pupil, uh, but that value is not as light as the surrounding uh, flesh tones. Uh, so I'm also taking that into account, and I'm also sculpting out uh, with just a few lines the shape of the actual eye itself. Uh, the the uh, peak of convexity, uh, so the top of the hill, if you will, uh, around the curvature of the eye is usually highest a little bit uh, to a little bit closer to the tear duct. So the tear duct being uh, the region furthest to the uh, the left of the right eye. Uh, that would be the tear duct. Um, imagine pictures of uh, tears coming from eyes usually come from the tear duct. But any, in any case, the highest region of the curve, being the peak of convexity, is usually uh, a little bit further past uh, the tear duct, and it tapers uh, slightly as it rolls around the side of the eye. And so with that same uh, brush, and with a little more of the flesh tone, I, um, I'm starting to create a dark light around the side of the eye socket, around the sides of the structure of the eye. And I'm pretty much, uh, I'm thinking more about the value, uh, in this case, because the value itself uh, is what creates the form. Uh, the value is the simplest way to indicate form. Um, now with the color, I do vary uh, a little bit cooler towards the sclera, like I mentioned, and a little bit warmer as we roll across the tear duct, uh, and a little bit uh, lighter and more on the pinkish region as we approach the uh, lighter regions of the uh, the flesh, as you can see. And I'm going to use that same mixture uh, that I made for the sclera of the eye to the right of the canvas uh, to match that with the eye on the left of the canvas. And uh, you can think of eyes themselves, so the, uh, the pupil and the whole structure of the eye itself to have kind of a center line. Uh, think about it as a ball with a center line. And uh, the two eyes need to be oriented uh, so that they're looking in the same direction. So I also kind of think about the space uh, between the pupil and the tear duct. Um, with each eye. Um, so that's why I, I use the same brush to uh, put the sclera on the eye to the left of the canvas uh, so that you can have the same kind of distance uh, or to put it simply you see as much of the sclera on the left eye as you see on the right eye so that it matches up that center line of the eye so that both pupils look, that, look like they're looking in the same direction. Now this is also sometimes a matter of uh, stepping back from your canvas um, because if you're too close to it you may see the eyes oriented in the right position but you're say four inches away from your painting and then as you move further back you find that it's completely wrong and that happens to me so much. That happens to me all the time. I always, you've seen me in other videos having to adjust the eyes ever so, ever slightly. Sometimes I never see that mistake and that painting goes on having that mistake. But in this case, I was a little bit more uh, focused on the orientation of the uh, direction in which each eye is looking. Now for the majority of the painting, uh, now we're approaching the one hour point, so the majority of the painting after that uh, is going to be uh, fine-tuning the forms. So I'm going to be uh, using uh, 
a combination of uh, different values that are already on the palette. Uh, slightly adjusting areas, making them a little bit darker, some areas a little bit lighter. Um, so as you can see uh, with this uh, smaller size of your round brush, I uh, made the gradation of values across the, uh, the shadow of the face just a little bit darker. I'm trying to make that shadow um, a little, or that transition from the light to the shadow a little softer. Uh, and that's pretty much what will uh, round out a form make a and make a form look more round and volumetric is describing the curvature of the light into the shadow uh, via the transition of value a very subtle transition of value from the light into the shadow and what I just used there was my fan brush and um, that wasn't meant to blur anything. The fan brush is pretty much uh, just to eliminate any kind of glare. Uh, sometimes if you uh, move the paint in a particular direction very lightly, uh, it can help to reduce the glare. Uh, but in any case, with these smaller brushes, I'm starting to uh, change the uh, gradation of value across this area uh, of the eye. I'm trying to make that transition uh, much more defined now uh, between the darker plane as it rolls across the side uh, of the eye and then the lighter plane. And uh, with this brush, I am trying to soften that edge, uh, trying to blur it just a little bit. That was just a uh, dry uh, size, I believe size 2 sable brush. Um, but I try not to soften too much uh, artificially uh, with a dry sable. I try to match my values more closely with the paintbrush, uh, like I'm doing right now, uh, and let that assist me in making the edges softer or more uh, or harder uh, with the application of paint. Uh, what I mean by that is. Um, when you're painting wet on wet, if you apply your brush much more firmly uh, with more force onto the surface, uh, you will create a much harder edge. And if you apply the brush with less force, then you will create a uh, softer edge. And um, so that's what I mean by uh, gradating the values uh, via the brush mixtures. Notice how lightly now I'm pressing onto the canvas. Uh, with that value uh, color that I mixed up uh, to create that curvature of form as we roll across um, the that structure of the eye into the um, side of the face, the eye socket. Just slightly um, apply that brush stroke. Yet I mixed up that value. I made a I mixed up a lot of colors to create that value. I'm going to do the same thing right here on this portion of the face, ever so slightly uh, whispering the paint now onto uh, the surface to give me a much softer edge, yet I'm still using that color that I had mixed up onto the palette. So I'm not trying to uh, blend so much per se, uh, blending being uh, artificially smoothening out the uh, values with the sable brush, but I do blend at some points, uh, so to speak blend, I don't really think about it as blending, but it's oftentimes referred to as blending. And at this point you may be wondering where my close-up shots are um, as I apply these smaller applications of paint, um, but I found out uh, through experimentation that as I uh, zoom my camera closer towards the surface, uh, the actual uh, application of the brush stroke onto the panel or onto the panel uh, actually bounces a little bit. Uh, so it creates a kind of camera movement and I don't want the uh, camera to seem to be moving so much. I don't want to make anybody seasick by the motion of the, uh, the small motions of the uh, uh, paint application onto the surface. So that's why I'm keeping the camera at this angle. And I also lose a great deal of resolution 
uh, when I zoom closer to the surface, maybe once I get a, uh, a uh, better camera, I may be able to maintain a, a higher resolution uh, when zooming in. But I actually, uh, I like keeping the camera at this distance as you see me uh, mix these values now because uh, the camera is actually right next to my head actually uh, that might be kind of uh, funny trying to picture me painting with the camera right next to my head but uh, you're pretty much seeing what I see as I paint which is kind of cool uh, you're seeing exactly what I'm seeing um, and at the same perspective that I'm seeing uh, as I'm applying these values and mixing these colors of course as I mix uh, I kind of have to lift my arm around the uh, camera uh, which I kind of got used to um, after the first uh, 45 minutes or so of this film uh, but yeah I'm lifting my arm a little bit above the camera uh, so that I don't uh, interfere too much with the uh, composition of the camera angle um, but sometimes I mix under like across the camera but in any case, uh, keeping you at this distance from the camera actually helps you see what I'm seeing and helps you see how far away I am from the painting. I am actually this far away from the painting the entire time as I'm working. And this is so that I don't create any um, unnecessary minutia or I, uh, so that I don't hyper focus on any small little region of the painting without keeping track of the big picture uh, because the big picture is what people will see as I've mentioned the big picture is uh, uh, think about it as the first impression you get uh, when you meet somebody uh, that first impression means a lot especially when you're meeting uh, someone for the first time uh, you want to leave off the right kind of impression and so that's what um, that's why I try to keep myself this distance away uh, from the painting uh, for the entire painting so that I'm more focused on the big picture uh, so that I can create a better first impression. Uh, the first impression is pretty much uh, what you see. Think about it if you're walking across a museum and you spot a painting for the first time you're not really looking at that small little detail on the bottom right corner or anything like that in, a, in the, the painting. You're more focused on that big overall image. And um, that is essential even in, in uh, when you're documenting your work. Whenever people are uh, seeing your paintings for the first time, they're probably going to see a thumbnail on Instagram or Facebook or something like that and then click it. Uh, so even in that instance, the big picture uh, plays a great role in the overall development of your painting. Now remember, as I mentioned before, this painting demonstration, uh, you're seeing every single brushstroke. Um, every brushstroke that it took to create, create this painting is demonstrated in this video and every every mixture of paint is also demonstrated in this video um, so if you feel free to zoom into the picture um, if it doesn't pixelate too much or zoom in or scroll around onto the palette uh, that should should help you to scroll around the palette as I mentioned before to see exactly uh, which colors I used uh, on which or any particular region of the painting. That being said, what you're not seeing is what I use uh, to clean the brush or uh, medium wise. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, cleaning the brush, I, I usually clean the brush uh, when I move uh, from one area of paint, like one start color to another uh, so like when I move maybe from a bright uh, red and onto maybe like a cooler green uh, since they're complementary remember I said sometimes 
I will use the two together uh, to create a nice flesh tone, but other times I don't want uh, to uh, say kill off a color too much, like the bright pinks. Uh, so if there's like a, a neutral green on my brush in that same value region, uh, then I will start to uh, clean the brush ever so slightly with the paint thinner. I don't want to use too much. Uh, that's why I keep my uh, brushes organized uh, so that each uh, particular region of value, uh, like the hair mass has its own brush, the side of uh, the shadow of the face has its own brush, the dark lights have their own brush, the light lights have their own brush. Uh, so that helps me. Uh, not have to clean the brush too much though I do clean it uh, every once in a while just so my colors don't get uh, too confused uh, that helps me out in the process of developing this painting and for the medium uh, I actually just dip my brush into the medium and dab it almost completely dry um, and I choose to use stand oil as I mentioned before because it is a slow dryer and I don't work um, a la prima with a bunch of fast drying paint. I don't personally, but maybe there's a way I can, and I haven't figured it out yet. Um, but for the majority of my paintings, I actually use stained oil um, because I like to work in uh, longer sittings. Sometimes I'll be in my studio working uh, from 6 to 10 hours on a painting uh, without it drying on me, simply because... I use the uh, the stand oil, and stand oil is also a thickener, so that's why I use one fifth stand oil to uh, four fifths paint thinner because I don't want the medium to be too thick either. Uh, so it also creates a nice consistency of paint, and um, so that's how I use my mediums. But now let's get back into uh, what I've been doing so far with the painting. Uh, so now. I have all of my big shapes in check. Uh, you could technically call the painting finished, um, but what you don't often see with my videos um, is the small little touch-ups that I do in between little regions of paint. Uh, now if you scroll the video from where I am now until the end result, the changes in the painting will be very much minimal. Minimal with the exception of perhaps the highlight on the lip. Now, each little structure, each little substructure, now a substructure is a smaller structure on top of a larger structure. Uh, so say the entire structure of the head can be thought of as one large structure. The substructures could be um, the eye socket, uh, the nose, mandible, the jawline, those can be substructures resting on top of a large structure. Uh, so the boundaries between one structure to another structure have definite value changes. Notice the highlight that I'm putting on the lip now is one region of the lip most facing the light. So the angle of the plane where that highlight is that I'm applying the paint on right now is facing the light more than any of the other regions around it. Also, I should note that the edge, even though it's very small, the edge between the uh, highlight and the surrounding regions of paint is much more sharp uh, than the edges, say, as like right now, I was just painting uh, a little transitional value ever so slightly onto the, uh, onto the nose as it turns around the side plane of the nose. So from this point on of the painting, every little change that I'm making is very minute. I'm going into uh, little regions of value, such as uh, this uh, wing of the nose, and making the value just a little bit lighter as it receives more light. But now, now that you're seeing me apply uh, these little finishing touches if you will and rendering out these little forms you're starting to notice that the overall big picture isn't going to change that often uh, now the camera angle does change now and then uh, simply because um, sometimes I accidentally bumped into the camera 
Um, but I've tried to maintain uh, the overall distance between you and the canvas uh, to be equal to the distance from me, uh, from I and the canvas. Uh, like I mentioned before, I think that it's uh, it might be more beneficial to you to see exactly what I'm seeing as I develop this painting. Every tiny little uh, modulation and value as the bottom of the uh, zygomatic region that I just painted it now and now I am softening. I adjusted that value ever so slightly. Small little changes uh, from one plane to another plane and this is also uh, something that I uh, I can't really identify those changes uh, without standing further back from the painting and bouncing my eye back and forth between the model and the painting. And uh, so now I'm going to be putting in uh, more of a dark light. Remember the dark light? Uh, I'm defining it as the region uh, of the light just as it approaches the uh, separation between light and shadow. Uh, so that's what this plane is right here. And um, I'm also going to be applying the final little transition of paint. Now remember I'm making a softer edge uh, by applying less pressure onto the brush, yet still with the local value mixture that I want for that particular region of the painting. As I uh, modulate these small regions of value ever so slightly, um, as I create, as I develop these little minute changes to the painting now, um, I think I should talk also a little bit about uh, the physical act of painting. Uh, and that, I mean, the application of paint onto the surface. Now, it may seem like I've been working on this painting uh, for the entire time, and that's just not true. Um, I do take breaks every 15 minutes or every 20 minutes. Uh, I stand back often, um, but I think that uh, painting itself, I don't believe that it's that uh, good of an idea to stay there planted onto your painting for the entire duration of the painting. I think that it's important to take breaks uh, quite periodically and to separate yourself from uh, the painting as much as you can. And I also uh, found out uh, with myself that I do have a optimal time frame of which I'm most focused and making the best decisions and that's usually within the first hour or so of the painting where I'm much more awake, I'm much more aware. Not to say that I'm going to fall asleep while I'm painting, it's just like with any kind of puzzle that you're trying to figure out, it's important to know when uh, you need to take a break or step back and uh, put it aside for a little bit and then come back and um, further work on your puzzle. You can think of a painting as a, a puzzle. You're trying to figure out, you're given this information in front of you and you have these tools, uh, the paint and the brush and the medium. You're trying to uh, use all of this information to uh, conjure up a picture, a believable picture onto your surface. And oftentimes, it's important to also know yourself. Uh, know how long you can work on a painting uh, before you need to take a break because sometimes uh, it is possible to overwork yourself and to uh, thus not see things that you would see uh, more clearly had you been taking the proper uh, breaks and uh, standing back uh, periodically to get a uh, more of an outside uh, perspective onto your painting. You can see even now at this later stage of the painting, uh, I'm holding my paintbrush at the uh, end of the, the brush. Even at this stage, I'm trying to keep myself arm's length away from the painting 
holding the brush at this uh, distance. And uh, so I'm going to be darkening now the uh, cast shadow. So the shadow on the neck is being casted uh, from the, uh, the form of the, uh, the jaw. Therefore, it's a cast shadow. It's creating a cast shadow. And cast shadows are typically a little bit darker uh, than the shadow of the form of which that is casting that shadow. Um, so all that means is that the shadow on the actual face itself is going to be a little bit lighter, just a little bit lighter uh, than the cast shadow onto the neck. And uh, it's also a little bit darker, uh, but lighter as I roll across the, uh, the side of the neck to the left the side of the neck to the left there. Um, leaving that region just a little bit lighter because there is a uh, reflected light there just a little bit. And uh, also across the uh, the mandible, uh, across the, the jawline, that it is a little bit warmer uh, because there's some of that uh, warmth of the shirt reflecting onto uh, the shadow itself. And uh, reflected lights are kind of a dangerous uh, thing to someone that's just learning. So it's important to kind of play down the reflected lights just so that you don't lose your uh, delineation between light and shadow. But reflected lights uh, are actually a nice area to vary the hue as opposed to uh, varying the value. Uh, so, you, and oftentimes you can vary the color for a reflected light, yet maintain that region of the shadow in the same value family. And I let that reflected light show just a little more on the corner of the left side of the canvas, uh, so that that darker light, uh, also known as the terminator, so the terminator is a darker region between the separation between light and shadow. I'm also leaving that a little bit more predominant uh, so you can also see that the uh, jawbone, the zygomatic bone on the left side of the face so that it matches with the uh, jawbone on the right side of the face and with a little bit of variation onto the side of the neck here I'm going to uh, soften that edge just a little bit with a uh, a small dry uh, sable brush and, and now I'm going to just put a few little touches just for uh, aesthetic reasons onto the shirt onto the vignette the vignette being the region that's unfinished just a few little touches onto uh, the shirt pretty much just for uh, styles sake just uh, applying some uh, some broad brush strokes onto the shirt just to create a nice little vignette but that will be pretty much the uh, final brush strokes that I'm going to be applying onto the surface of this painting. So there you have it. You've witnessed in real time every single brush stroke and every single mixture of paint involved in making this painting. Thank you so much for watching this week's portrait painting demonstration and stay tuned for next week's video. Thank you. And if you'd like to see more of my artwork more often, please feel free to check out or follow my Instagram page at Upari Fine Art. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful week.